be here to on behalf of your Baird financial advisor. I'd like to welcome you to this month's Baird Wealth Strategies webinar. Our topic today is going to focus on inflation and rising interest rates. Our investment strategy analyst Ross Mayfield will give a market update focused on the Federal Reserve interest rate policy and inflation. He will touch on a near term outlook for both before handing it off to Nick Reisenbickler, manager of investment products to discuss the ramifications for portfolios and some potential strategies for this new environment. Then financial planner Chris Dolan will join the call and discuss planning strategies in these rising interest rates and the high inflation environment as well. So before I turn the call over to them, I do have a few housekeeping items that I'd like to highlight. For optimal viewing, we would suggest setting your layout to that side-by-side -side view via the circle in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. All participants are in listen-only mode, but we would love to hear from you. So we will host a Q&A at the end of today's session to address as many questions as time permits. Um, you can submit a question by clicking on that Q&A icon on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Just please be sure that you're addressing your questions to all panelists so all of our panelists can see them and uh, read out an answer to you. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available along with the slide deck about a week following today's presentation. You can get that through your Baird Financial Advisor or on BairdWealth.com. So thank you everyone for joining us. Ross, I will now turn the call over to you. Thank you so much, Justine, and uh, it's really great to be with everyone today. Um, I'm not sure there could be a more timely moment to have the conversation about inflation and interest rates, um, not just because of the market volatility and its relation to both of those topics, but because even in the last week, things have shifted significantly as far as uh, getting an uh, inflation report on Friday that was hotter than expected and how that will impact the Federal Reserve and their interest rate policy, their meeting as we speak. Um, so we'll get some news uh, on their policy very shortly. But in the meantime, um, I, I think it is probably timely to zoom back and kind of talk through how we got here. I think it's important to kind of lay the framework for where we are today to be to begin discussing where we'll go from here. And it starts with the pandemic in my mind. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic, you know, for some of us, it feels like maybe just a couple of months ago. Some of us, it might feel like a decade ago, but that March 2020 lockdown scenario not only locked people down, but it also introduced unprecedented monetary and fiscal stimulus to the tune of, you know, two trillion plus in fiscal stimulus. That's, you know, the stimulus checks, enhanced unemployment, paycheck protection program, as well as unprecedented monetary policy, which was zero percent interest rates, quantitative easing program, all to make sure that markets functioned and that the economy didn't go into a depression. I think that was good policy at the time. We avoided what surely would have been uh, a depressionary scenario. But a couple years later, a few dominoes flicked over and we end up paying for that in the form of inflation, which as you can see uh, via the chart on the screen is at a 41 year high. If you read the news, if you watch the news, if you, you know, listen to people at the gas station, you don't need me to tell you that. Um, but nevertheless, that's where we are. Um, May's, or May's inflation number, which came out just last Friday was a surprise to the upside. And that's where the market volatility over the last couple of days has really come from. There was a bit of a narrative that Inflation was high, but it at least probably peaked. We were on the way down and the Federal Reserve would not have to be as aggressive. Uh, that narrative was, was popped on Friday and we're seeing the ramifications today. But anyway, back to where we started. So lockdown and uh, stimulus. So the 2020 recession was actually the first recession in recorded history where incomes rose. And so what you do when you lock people in their homes but their incomes are rising, they're gonna spend that money on the things they can spend it on, which is good. So things like TVs, things like cars, things like home furnishings. Um, for 40 plus years, goods, that kind of broad category of stuff, had been getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. You know, if you think about what a TV cost and what the quality of that was 20 years ago versus today, you can kind of feel that. Um, but what the pandemic did because of those factors was cause goods to rise in price rapidly, more rapidly than services, which is where we usually see inflation. Part of this was lockdowns uh, across the globe, locking down factories, locking down ports, um, clogs at you know, ports and shipping uh, lanes all across the country, trucker shortages. So at basically every kink in the supply chain, there was an issue that caused the price of goods and the amount of goods available uh, to, to be limited. So we started off seeing goods inflation post pandemic, and that was really the story for a year, a year and a half. 
this was where the Federal Reserve was getting their transitory policy from or their transitory line of thinking was, well, this is all pandemic related. Once some of those pandemic kinks clear, once some of the fiscal stimulus fades, we can get back to a more normal operating environment. As we know, with inflation at 41 year high, that was not the case. Um, and really, you know, well, I should say quickly, a, an example of this goods inflation is in the used car market. I mentioned, you know, TVs, home furnishings, but maybe nowhere was it more uh, emblematic than in the, in the market for used cars, um, which had been decelerating for a decade. And then all of a sudden we're up 60% in a year and a half. That was supply shortages. That was uh, aggressive demand. If you couldn't fly, maybe you might buy a used car and go on road trips with your family. It was a perfect storm of all these kind of pandemic related factors that we, that we think about. But that is rolling over, as you can see in the chart. Today, the problem is much more in services, and we can see that via wage growth. Um, so people are being paid more, the job market is very tight, and you're starting to see it show up in services. Now, why is that a bigger problem for the Federal Reserve or anyone who wants inflation to come down? Is because the price of eggs can come down pretty easily. The price of a TV can come down pretty easily if all of those supply chain you know, items kind of unkink. If you give your employees a raise uh, or if you hire a new employee at a certain salary, it's much harder to take that away without inducing you know, layoffs and people really try to avoid that. So wage growth is stickier. Growth in uh, rent is stickier because it's set by contract. So these are the types of inflation that can persist. And these are the types of inflation that the Federal Reserve has a vested interest in fighting. That's why you've seen them get more aggressive over the past couple of months is because wage growth is at multi-decade highs. And on the other hand, food, energy, commodity pressure, which is coming uh, you know, from pressures across the globe, but primarily from war in Ukraine. Um, this is food inflation, which is at a 30 year high and up 25% in just the last year. Uh, Ukraine and Russia are responsible for a large amount of the fertilizer made in the world. Uh, they're obviously responsible for a large amount of uh, crude oil and natural gas, which are inputs into you know, farming, agriculture, as well as many other parts of the world. But these two things are critical. They're what drove the May inflation beat that I was talking about last Friday. And they are very much out of the Federal Reserve's control. The Federal Reserve can raise interest rates to curb demand, but they can't pump more oil. They can't plant new crops. So this is very much a problem for the Fed as well, because it's a bit outside of their purview. So all of this combines to lead you to a much more aggressive Federal Reserve and interest rates rising rapidly, which is something that we've seen, you know, really over the past six plus months. But even just in the last week, the rise in interest rates has been meteoric and historic. Um, the one last piece of the puzzle for the Federal Reserve is inflation expectations. So inflation expectations are very important and something that the Fed watches closely because inflation can kind of feed on itself. If you're setting prices for your restaurant today, you might think about what things are gonna cost and you can drive inflation yourself. If you're buying something today because you expect the price to go up in six months from now, you're contributing to that inflationary pressure by buying those items. It's very much a self-fulfilling cycle. So once expectations get out of hand, it can be very hard for the Fed to rein back in. Um, this chart is a market-based long-term inflation expectations gauge. Um, it's very much in line right now, but near-term inflation expectations as uh, measured by consumer survey have gotten way out of hand. Another reason the Fed is being very aggressive. Consumers expect prices to rise in the next year as much as they have at any point in the last decade. Um, people see it every day. They see it at the grocery store. They see it at the gas pump and they see it rising constantly. So what we do is we extrapolate those experiences and again, that can become a self-fulfilling cycle. So all of this combines for a Federal Reserve that needs to be much more aggressive in raising interest rates. And so that's what we see. And that's where the market volatility is coming from. I think this chart is maybe the most important chart of the year. Um, the blue line is the, the expectations for number of uh, quarter percent rate hikes that the Federal Reserve will enact in 2022. As recently as the fourth quarter of 2021, that was less than one. Today, it is closer to 14 rate hikes. Um, I noted on the red stars there where the stock market peaked and where the bottom has been so far. And this coincides very much with the rapid rise in interest rate expectations. And so far, the Federal Reserve has delivered on those expectations. They raised um, a quarter of a percent, a half percent. And then today, they'll either raise a half percent or three quarters of a percent 
and set the stage for a much faster pace of tightening over the remainder of the year. This has been the story of markets. Stock markets earnings are not falling apart. The consumer is doing pretty well. This is entirely related to the interest rate expectations driven by Federal Reserve, which is driven by inflation. So it's a very, uh, it's a very tidy story in some sense, but in another sense, it's a lot of moving parts that are contributing to cause this uh, truly historic inflation that we haven't seen in 40 years. A great example of that is in the, is in the housing market. So to back up quickly, the reason the Federal Reserve raises interest rates to fight inflation is because they want to cool domestic demand. That's pretty much it. They raise rates um, throughout the economy. It causes less borrowing, um, less spending on credit cards, less auto loans, less capital spending at U.S. companies. Um, but nowhere is this more kind of obvious and quickly obvious than in the housing market. Um, the 30-year fixed mortgage rate has basically doubled from 3% to 6% um, in under under a year, but really even less than that, really under six months just this year. Um, the housing market was as hot as it's been in a long time, uh, kind of post-pandemic, as people relocated, as millennials shifted into prime home buying territory. But since this spike in mortgage rates has occurred, uh, home building sentiment has fallen off a cliff, pending sales have rolled over dramatically, mortgage applications have been cut in half basically from a year ago this week, there is already a dramatic cooling occurring in the, in the housing market. And on one hand, this is, this is a bad thing for the economy. Housing is a, a fundamental part of our economy. There are industries all tangential to housing, whether it's home furnishing or building or design. Um, but on the other hand, the Federal Reserve is, is very much vested in cooling the economy to bring inflation down, bring demand down. You kill the demand side of the story and bring it in line with supply that is very much still gnarled by COVID-19. Housing is a great example of that, and I expect that you'll continue to see signs of the housing market rolling over in the next couple of weeks and months. It's, it's not great news for the economy, but it's what the Fed wants and what the Fed needs to battle inflation at this point. All right, so that was, a, that was the economy. Let's focus quickly on markets. I, I mentioned that this inflation and interest rate activity is driving the stock market weakness that we've seen you know, really since the beginning of the year, the market uh, by the S&P 500 peaked on January 3rd, and it's been uh, in a downfall ever since. We just officially entered a bear market um, the other day. What I'm showing, these two charts are, are, are a bit kind of wonky, but basically what the, the takeaway should be is that higher inflation and higher interest rates, both of which we're seeing today and both of which are very much related, cause stock market multiples to contract. So the PE multiple is one you might have seen referenced. It's basically what are investors willing to pay for a share of the stock market's earnings. Earnings have held up great. This is a, a positive sign, in my opinion. Company earnings have done quite well. They've held up well. But the price that investors are willing to pay for those earnings in a high inflation, in a high interest rate environment, has contracted dramatically. This is playing out exactly as we've seen historically. That's what you're seeing in these charts. A higher 10-year yield uh, on the Treasury causes multiple contraction. Higher inflation does the same thing. So the 2022 sell-off that we're all kind of living through is very much emblematic of this. So that was a lot of bad news, a lot of negativity about inflation and record highs and what the Fed will have to do to stop it, which is cool the economy down. But there are some reasons for optimism, and there are some reasons that a, a mild recession or the, the soft landing that the Fed is aiming for are still very much in play, even as aggressive as they're getting even as much as the stock market is sold off. Number one is consumer savings. So this is the personal savings rate, uh, which is a monthly data set over time. Early in the COVID-19 pandemic, this spiked to levels not even come close to throughout history. Um, stimulus combined with not being able to leave and spend your money, combined with uh, you know people actually keeping their jobs and white collar incomes rising, um, led to $2 trillion plus of savings in the consumer sector. So there is a huge cushion of savings that is allowing the consumer to continue spending into the teeth of inflation and will cushion them should we enter an economic slowdown in the next year, year and a half. This is, this is not a luxury that you get most of the time heading into a recession. Um, most of the time heading into a recession, you know, consumer and corporates, you know, they're kind of stretched. Maybe they're, they're using more revolving credit like credit cards. Today, there's a huge kind of cushion it doesn't mean that a, a slowdown isn't coming, 
but this is a luxury that we don't often get um, heading into a slowdown. And you can see it in the data. This is US retail sales, which is just folks getting out there and spending their money. Um, it dropped off early in the pandemic as the lockdown occurred, but quickly bounced back and has been above its pre-pandemic trend ever since. You don't really have to look far to see people spending their money, uh, particularly on services. There was a huge pent up demand for services um, after the pandemic. People wanted to get out and travel. People wanted to get out and go to sports games and concerts. I mean, you can go anywhere related to a service and you'll see folks spending and spending in spite of historic inflation, right? So the cushion built up that I mentioned earlier, combined with strong wage growth and a strong job market has led to consumer spending that has continued and why the economy is still on pretty solid footing despite the inflation that the Fed is trying to battle. Another reason for that strong spending and consumer confidence that they can go out and spend is that the job market is historically hot. This is uh, a chart of job openings, just kind of broad job openings in the economy. You know, what's new, it's at a record as well. Everything seems to be at some sort of record these days, but there are still over 11 million job openings in the system right now. This is enabling people to switch jobs easily, quit their job and find a new job, get a pay raise in doing so. A lot of the wage growth of the last year has been people getting new jobs and switching those jobs or going and getting a new job and coming back to their boss and saying, you know, hey, here's what I'm worth in the marketplace. Um, can you pay me this or I'll leave? That's pressured wage inflation. Um, and that's a problem for U.S. companies who are paying those wages, but it's good for the U.S. consumer who is spending those out into the economy. The Fed will want to bring this down. There is a thought that the Fed can bring job openings down without actually increasing the unemployment rate too much. This would be another piece of evidence that we could head towards a soft landing or a minor economic slowdown versus a deeper recession. If you eliminate job openings from the economy, you eliminate some of that job switching and quitting, getting those big pay bumps, you bring wage inflation down and companies can operate a little cleaner. That's a perfect world. I'm not sure if it'll play out like that, but that's where the Fed would like to go. And the job openings in the system uh, kind of argue that there's potential for that right now. So I'm going to wrap it up with this slide before I pass it off to my colleagues. Um, quickly, our, our, our friends at Strategus, which is a, a Baird company, they're a macroeconomic research firm under the Baird umbrella, they put a 40% chance of a recession in 2023. Um, this is very much incorporating a lot of the things I've talked about, the Federal Reserve raising interest rates to cool the economy, inflation, pressuring a consumer that has been spending so far, um, but again, record gas prices, um, food prices spiking, that ultimately conspires to make it a lot harder on a consumer to live day to day. So there's a, there's a chance of a recession in the next year. A slowdown is the point. So this should be you know, kind of expected and baked in. And again, the market is sold off you know, 22, 23%. It's very much you know, pricing for something like that. What to watch from here? I put a chart of productivity um, on this slide because I think productivity is really important from here. This is basically just how efficient are our workers? How much can you produce for X amount of inputs? And the reason productivity is important is because post pandemic, we thought there might be a productivity boom. It spiked for a couple of uh, readings. You know, people were working from home. There was less need for um, a lot of fixed overhead. And what we thought was that a productivity boom could allow people to produce more um, at the same cost. So you could get wage growth without necessarily getting price increases that lead to inflation. We have not seen this persist. We'll be watching this closely going forward. Um, geopolitics would be the other thing. Obviously, energy inflation is very much related to the conflict in Ukraine right now. We'll be watching that closely, but that is very much out of uh, the hands of the Federal Reserve, uh, of course, and much more reliant on you know, the kind of sovereign economies of the world. What to remember as we kind of leave this, this may have been, um, you know, unfortunately, somewhat of a, a, a dire economic outlook because things are, are pressured right now. But what I want to remind investors, uh, particularly, are that these recessions and these sell-offs are common and really necessary for the market to function. So since World War II, since 1945, we've had 13 recessions. Um, we've had 17 sell-offs of roughly 20% or more, of which we are in one right now. Despite that, we've seen a 450,000% return in the stock market to the tune of 11, 11.5% 11 a year. So these sorts of uh, kind of economic issues and downturns and crises are not new. 
Um, really, a lot of times it's the market overshooting, the economy overshooting, needing to cool down before you can take off again. But I want to remind folks that this stuff is very much part of the norm. And at this moment in time, it's just the Fed trying to regain the balance that we had pre-pandemic um, after kind of a calamitous economic event that threw us all off. So with that, I, I feel I've rambled enough. I'm going to turn it over uh, to my colleague, Nick Reisenbeckler, to talk about uh, some strategies that, that can be implemented to combat inflation in one's portfolios and in one's financial plan. So, Nick, all yours. Thanks, Ross, and uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. It is inflation and rising interest rates are top of mind, and really, how does that per, uh, affect the portfolio and what can you in, do to invest? Um, I'll say that, like, ahead of this time, everybody's goals uh, in their investment and their risk tolerance is going to be different. So it's important to talk to your financial advisor on uh, what really is going to be best uh, for your for your situation. Um, so one of the ways to protect against inflation is by the most widely used one is tips. Um, a lot of our um, what these are is treasury inf inflation protected securities, and tips can is their income is going to and their value is going to be related to CPI. Um, however, these are fixed income instruments. Um, they tick um, and they will have effects, be affected by rising interest rates and maturities. Um, so when you look at TIPS, if you look at a chart that I have here as kind of inflation expectations were ramping up last year, um, you saw that the TIPS um, were moving in tandem um, with inflation expectations. However, once January started, and when really that's really when, as Ross talked about, we saw an inflection point there on expectations of rate hikes um, going up dramatically, um, and inflation expectations going up dramatically, and it would be kind of a, a quicker move. That's when there was more of a divergence in inflation uh, protection and tips, and then how it actually was relation to um, investment. So. If it is something that you would like to um, consider, or your financial advisor consider, we we typically suggest going a lot shorter um, term because there's less interest rate risk there. You have the maturity being shorter, and if this is truly a, a transit more transitory inflation time, um, those will mature and the principles will go up at that particular time. Overall. Um, how, how have all asset classes kind of performed in, a, in an inflation environment? Um, there's all different types um, of investments on how you can do some of our investable, some of them aren't investable. Uh, but this bar chart kind of just gives you a history of kind of like how have things done since 1950 and how do, they, how do the prices move relative to inflation? At the very bottom of that, you'll see that long-term um, government bonds um, tend to have a negative correlation to inflation. Usually that's due to rising interest rates environment. So as inflations go, then go uh, prices or interest rates go up, then prices go down, um, and that causes uh, the return to be there. What you'll see though, the highest correlation to inflation is gonna be your real assets, your commodities, your real estate, gold. Um, those are investments that a lot of financial advisors and clients use to invest in, and they can really help protect clients in time, times of inflation. Commodities, in, my, in our opinion, are probably a great way to hedge against inflation for short-term investments. Um, if we, the expectation for uh, inflation is to, to rise in the short term, Commodities can provide that. Um, over the long term, um, they can erode a little bit over time. Um, this kind of chart shows like the relation between how commodity prices have performed relative um, to inflation expectations. And you can see that they really move in tandem um, in those short period of times as expectations um, continue to increase. So but as you start to think about, um, if you're worried about inflation, how can I help protect portfolios? Having an allocation um, to commodities um, really can help protect um, and hopefully generate 
positive returns in an inflationary environment. Another way, this is this type of investment um, is, is really not for everybody. It's going to be unique to each person's um, investment goals um, and qualifications. Uh, but private real estate is one area that has actually done well in both a rising interest rate environment and a high inflation environment. And part of that is when you think about real estate, we all, a lot of us own individual real estate. Some of us might own it. Um, investment real estate properties. And as interest rates values go up, you're able, or interest rates and inflation goes up, you're able to actually increase rental rates. Ross talked about that a little bit. As you, it's a lot easier as contracts come up, you can raise um, uh, rental rates and that gets passed along, which increases valuation. Now that really works well in the private sector. It doesn't work so well in the public sector because the public sector, like all stocks, are going to be traded on um, a lot of specul or price to earnings, uh, and they'll kind of look at that in multiple expansions or detractions. And typically, in a, a rising interest rate environment, they might not move hand in hand between public and private real estate. So private real estate tends to have a, a lower volatility, uh, but at the same cost, it's very illiquid. Um, so it's not it's not really meant for every single investor. So it's really to talk um, before making any suggestions about if this is right for you. You have to kind of think about what is important, what are your liquidity needs, and to see if this might be an appropriate investment, long term investment um, for yourself. And lastly, I want to talk a little bit about um, the fixed income side of things. Is it's been a while since we've seen fixed income markets go negative. Um, really, we've been in a bull market uh, for fixed income for quite some time. And uh, this year, there's definitely been some pain um, as interest rate expectations have increased pretty rapidly. Um, what, we've, what we noticed is it started a little bit older, but you can kind of see that, that what the Fed is projecting as interest rates and what the market is projecting the interest rates to be are quite different and it's actually made the fed's job a lot easier because the market has actually already been ahead of the fed on where they believe the market the fed fund rate should be and where interest rates should be over the long term um so they've been able to price that in now what we've seen though ahead of that is because the market's ahead of those expectations that you're actually starting to see some some sort of attractiveness on the shorter end of the curve. Um, so ultra short term bond funds may be an opportunity. A lot of bad news has already been priced into that. They've been able to increase rates pretty quickly. We would definitely shy away from the, the longer term. There's still some risk um, on longer term bonds. Um, if they, depending on what happens with the Fed, there could be some more volatility on the long end of the curve as the the yield curve still remains relatively flat um, on the longer end of the curve and, and even inverted in, in some cases. Um, one other way, if you're really, if you're kind of scared and you want to have some, um, what to do with some fixed income, you have it there for safety um, and preservation, especially as you're in retirement or near in retirement age, money market funds are a good op option to help protect against rising interest rates and they're able to pass those yields on much faster um, than a lot of other securities. So as the Fed raises rates, you'll actually see the money market funds quickly follow minus the expense ratio of the funds. So we're already starting to see with the Fed fund rate right now, prior to today's meeting, um, up to 1% um, on the, the max, we're starting to see money market funds start to near that. And we expect that as those rate hikes continue to go up, we expect that the yields on the money market funds will continue to go up as well. Now, just as a reminder, when inflation is as high as it is, the, the real yields on that is still negative, um, but uh, it is um, it's still a positive actual return in general relative to what we have seen over the last six months in, in a lot of the other fixed income areas. So that kind of covers like a little bit of the investment opportunity. And now I would like to pass it over to Chris to talk about the financial planning 
and, and things that you can do um, in your talking to your financial advisor um, and things you can do in your real life to address planning needs. Nick, thank you. I appreciate that. So I know after all this talk, uh, some of the questions on your minds are, well, what do we do? <laughs> so I'd like to share a few ideas today of what you can do. What are some of the buttons you can push? push? What are some of the levers that you can pull that you actually have control over in your life? So first thing is to talk about <clears throat> what I call the sequence of spending risk. A lot of you have probably heard about a sequence of returns risk. Uh, there's also a sequence of spending risk. So what this refers to is the sequence of what happens right when you retire. So if you retire or you're in a position where you're drawing on your portfolio, the sequence of returns risk says that if you happen to have some very poor returns in the portfolio right up front versus down the road, it's more damaging than those same negative returns down the road. The same thing with spending. If you overspend right at the very beginning of your retirement trajectory, that can be more damaging than spending those same larger dollar amounts farther down the road. So <clears throat> with high inflation, bread is more expensive, your cars are more expensive. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So an actionable item is to drill down into your budget, right? That's not the funnest thing to do over the weekend, I know, uh, but it can make a big difference uh, there are programs out there now that can help you track your transactions and, and label all the reoccurring transactions for you. Some people find that they signed up for Disney Plus and they signed up for Netflix before that, and then they signed up for HBO, and they've got all these different uh, reoccurring transactions, and they realize I'm actually not even using, you know, half of what I've signed up for. So. That's one thing I would recommend is drill down into your budget. Look at what your discretionary spending is, the reoccurring amounts specifically, because those are the ones you forget about and can add up over time. <clears throat> so the other thing I would do if I were you is model your spending patterns. So this actually will probably help you feel better about everything. Um, recently, I've been doing a lot of financial plans with clients who um, that's what we're doing, and they're finding that even if they do spend a little more because they have this fear of inflation making things more expensive right now, that with the long-term projections and long-term assumptions, things still look fine because what we're talking about today is today, and the long-term averages still are holding true. So I would talk to your advisor and look at model modeling some spending patterns. So what I mean specifically by that is model, what if I spend, you know, some extra dollars or percentage the first three years or first five years of my retirement? How does that affect the long-term projection of success? What if I <clears throat> decide to just model spending two or three percent less now throughout the future? You know, two or three percent really isn't that much, um, over the long term, it can make a big difference. So those are just some ideas on how to handle what it is that you're feeling, especially when it comes to how much you're spending. So here's some, here's some ideas, potential strategies really on how you can take advantage of the fact that we've seen some higher inflation these days. So as Ross alluded to, the job market is hot right now. Um, we're, we're seeing Record job openings. We're also seeing record voluntary leaving of jobs. So what that means is people are quitting their jobs with a lot of confidence that they'll be able to find another one pretty quickly. So um, what this means is that if you are really worried about your retirement, you're worried about the cost of living going up so much, the best way to offset that is to earn more and save more. Well, how can you earn more? Maybe now is the time to invest in yourself and look out there and see how valuable you are in the marketplace with your skills and experience and potentially increase your income by job hopping. That's actually a really hot topic right now is, you know, what kind of jobs are out there? Am I going to have to continue to commute <clears throat> or not commute? Can I work from home? In fact, <clears throat> just uh, recently, the Society for Human Resource Management said that about half of people are reporting that they do want to work remotely. <clears throat> However, Excuse me. <clears throat> the other half are saying, 
I would be willing to work in the office. And if I did, I know that that's valuable because a lot of people aren't willing to do it. And specifically, they said that for a 30 minute commute, people would be willing to do that if they had a 20% increase in their salary. Uh, if they were to take on a 15 minute commute, then they would do that. If they were to receive a 15% increase in their salary. So just some interesting things to think of. The next point here, refinance. I know that maybe if you've been watching the news, if you've been paying attention, you've been hearing that for, for years. And so you're thinking, why are we talking about this? Well, historically, 30 year mortgages are still low. If you look at a long term chart, decades and decades long of where we are on mortgage rates, they're still historically low. They're still lower than they were in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So they've been sitting around, you know, at the high levels, five or 6% for about 20 years. So if you happen to take out a loan, you know, 15, 20 years ago, and you you didn't get the lowest rate that you really think you should have, and you never got around to refinancing now, it's time to still look at doing that. Money historically is still relatively cheap. Another strategy, and I call this one the upside to the downside, and that is Roth conversions. Why am I talking about this now? Because if we look at <clears throat> what's happened in the marketplace, uh, some folks' portfolios are down, certainly, especially if they're equity centric in the portfolio and so let's just assume there's a, a client with a traditional ira of a hundred thousand dollars for round easy math so let's say that portfolio has dropped 20 percent it's now sitting at eighty thousand dollars if you had been considering already the advantages and weighing those with any disadvantages of doing a rough conversion something to keep in mind is that if you were now to convert that account you would only pay taxes on the 80,000, not the 100 that it was. With long-term prospects in the marketplace and having confidence in the markets, when you, when you convert that Roth IRA, now you're only going to have the growth come back on the upside, all tax-free. So again, it's a, it's a percentage game. 100,000, now 80, you convert the entire account and you're gonna pay less taxes because you're converting less, that's less income. Another way to look at this, let's say now we're talking about a traditional IRA of maybe a million dollars. And you were originally thinking of maybe converting 100,000. So now, if you were to do that and you still convert the same 100,000, you're going to have the same amount of taxes because 100,000 income to you right now is the same as it was earlier in the year. But that percentage is a larger percentage of the overall account because the account has decreased in size. It's not a million dollars anymore. It's less than that. So if you convert the hundred thousand, you're you're converting a larger percentage of that traditional IRA. And again, because growing back on the upside tax-free, it's something that's very attractive. It's actually quite popular right now in the industry. Uh, what's being reported is about an 18% increase in Roth conversions. Uh, in the first quarter of this year versus last year, first quarter of 2021. So it's definitely something to consider and walk through the analysis and the numbers and see if it makes sense for you. The other thing I would offer up is to make sure you're doing what you can to focus on any sorts of cost of living adjustments that are available to you. When it comes to pensions, the best pensions have cost of living adjustments built into them. Pensions have kind of gone the way of the dodo bird in our country. Uh, the 401k approach is much more attractive for employers to offer now. But for those who have a pension available to them, make sure that you are looking towards the options that allow for the cost of living adjustments that are included. Now, something that applies to everybody, just about everybody, anybody who's qualified for Social Security you have cost of living adjustments uh, built into that. So that's what this chart is that we're looking at here. If you look at the blue line, which is the cost of living increases that Social Security has offered over the years versus the consumer price index, that's the orange line, they're practically on top of each other. So even though the cost of living adjustments are never as large as we want them to be, they are coming in and they are executing the action they're meant to do, and that is 
try to keep pace with inflation to help people be able to spend what they need to spend on what they need on, on the things that they need when they're retired. So maximize that. So how do you maximize your COLA? Well, maximize your social security. If you have that decision in front of you, I would highly recommend speaking with your financial advisor and going through one of our social security analyses, because that will allow you to see what, based on your numbers, tailored to your situation, exactly which strategy down to the month and year, when to apply, that would allow you to have the most lucrative approach for your household with social security. A larger social security benefit means the cost of living adjustments are gonna be larger as well from a dollar perspective. All right, so now we're down to this last slide here. Just a couple of last notes on things to keep in mind as you're doing some of these analysis, uh, some of this analysis work and some of the forecasting that's done. The forecasting software we use is Money Guide Pro for the most part. Our long-term assumption for inflation that we're using is 3%. And if you look at the long-term for the past 20 years, the long-term inflation rate is less than that. It's like in the mid twos. So some would actually argue that 3% is a little too high. It sounds funny to say, I know, because we're talking about inflation right now at 6%. Um, but again, that's just today. That's what's happening today. Uh, so don't lose sight of the forest because of one tree right in front of you. Um, over time, 3% is still a very acceptable and even conservative assumption for inflation. Uh, we're using a 2% COLA assumption on Social Security. We actually think, of course, it'll be higher than that uh, to match inflation, but we're just being really conservative there. And then healthcare has inflated at a higher rate over the years, so 5.8% is what we're using there. I would caution anybody to avoid any knee-jerk reactions. Um, so that's why I've highlighted these assumptions and why they're still valid, because if you ratchet up inflation assumptions over the long term, it's going to be very damaging to a forecast, um, simply because that's, it hasn't been reality over the long term in our country. So one thing about Baird and the way we do financial planning is we always err on the side of caution. So if you go and look at some other forecasting software that's available to you, you may not realize that what they're using is a risk-free approach versus a real return approach. A risk-free approach, approach means that that software assumes that the returns in the individual asset classes are going to get larger as the Fed raises rates, because as the Fed raises rates, then you're going to have uh, higher coupon rates on government bonds and, and treasuries. And those are the risk-free assets that are used to then calculate, well, what's the equity um, return gonna be? Because now we have a, a risky asset and there has to be a delta there on the return assumption. In our software, we use a real return. So when inflation is modeled higher, um, it actually doesn't push up any of the returns at all. It actually assumes that all it's doing is eating into your spending. So. Keep that in mind. We're erring on the side of caution and being very conservative about that if you're doing comparisons. So that is the meat of what I had to share today. I'll turn the time back over to Justine to wrap things up. Great. Thank you so much, Chris and Nick and Ross. Uh, we really do appreciate all of your comments and candor here. We are going to switch over into a Q&A session at this time. And I do see quite a few questions that have come in already. But I will just remind everyone that if you would like to ask a question, you can do so via that Q&A icon on the bottom right hand side of your screen. So with that, I will turn it back over to you guys to kind of start running through some of these. Sure, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll grab the 1st 1 and uh, th there are a couple. So, um, someone asked basically, how does the Fed uh, reduce the amount of open job? open jobs or how do they cool the labor market off in an attempt to, to balance inflation. And I think in some ways you're already seeing this, right? So one mechanism by raising interest rates, um, you make it a little harder for companies to, to operate. So when you can basically, you know, when you're a company and you can borrow for functionally for free, you can do a lot of things that you might not otherwise do in an environment with a more expensive borrowing cost. Um, so, you know, today, there are the, the tech sector and some of the growthier sectors of the market, those stocks have been hit the hardest by rising rates. Um, 
partially because they've been some of the biggest benefactors of low rates. And if you, you can just go through the headlines, a lot of these companies are already putting in hiring freezes or taking job positions down. In some more extreme cases, doing layoffs, but we really haven't gotten to that part of the cycle yet. Um, the, the larger point being the Fed can cool the demand for labor by make, making it more expensive for companies to operate by raising interest rates. And then those companies are forced to make, make, make harder decisions, right? Do we, do we try to do more with less? Can we, can we squeeze out more profits out of the employees we do have? Can we you know, maybe increase hours or increase efficiency? Um, and then those job openings, in theory, should naturally come down. I mean, I'll, you know, obviously, sitting at a record, it, it's kind of an untested theory, but that's the idea that the Fed is aiming for. Um, I can grab, I'll, I'll grab one more just while I'm kind of talking about the Fed. Um, someone asked, how does their balance sheet kind of come into play in all of this? So part of the Fed's emergency monetary policy was something called quantitative easing, which was basically they went out into the market and they bought bonds, both to push yields down, to keep uh, borrowing costs low, and to provide liquidity into the market. So they're buying a bond. In doing so, they're pushing the yield down. They're also putting kind of cash into the market, not exactly, but but functionally. Um, so if if they're flipping that policy, basically, which is what they're planning to do with quantitative tightening, which is part of the the tool set they're using now to combat inflation, in theory, the, somewhat of the opposite effect would happen. Um, yields will rise. Long term yields will rise. We're seeing that today. Um, and again, that has the same effect as I talked about, higher borrowing costs for companies and consumers that, that reduces demand in basically every sector of the economy. At the same time, if the Fed isn't you know, out there actively buying bonds, in theory, there's less liquidity in the system, less kind of cash and liquidity. And a lot of the uh, you know, inflation we're seeing is in part due to an uptick in uh, money supply and liquidity in the system. So in theory, what they want to do with their balance sheet is just kind of start to reverse that process. Um, they started to do that uh, in the mid 2010s as they unwound some of that policy from the financial crisis era. You know, in theory, they're gonna start doing that again this summer and, and we'll see what level they get to before they kind of put the brakes on that. But those were two questions I saw on the Fed. Uh, there are a few more I could take, but I'll turn it over to Chris and Nick to see if there's any that you guys wanna jump on. I'll take one, uh, Ross. I, we got a question on defined outcome products um, that are available, and this this pr question gets a little bit in the weeds a little bit. So we probably suggest that we talk to your financial advisor um, on what we do and do not have available. We do have some defined outcome products and in, in, um, structured annuities and structured um, notes uh, for those types of clients that are looking to be able to kind of have some protection under the downside, but cap their upside. So there are some products available out there that we do have um, available at Baird, but definitely reach out to your financial advisor um, and we can be able to talk through those options for you. Sure, I'll, I'll take one here. If someone is uh, mentioning that a 20% jump in pay is rare and I'm, when I was referencing a 20% pain jump, that was a survey done by the Human Resource Management Society. So that's what people, that's what workers are saying they would like to have. So of course, the employer is gonna push back on that and you know there'll be some happy middle ground, right? Um, you know, another note on the, the labor market is like Ross mentioned, I mean, there's also wage growth at multi-decade high. So it really is a possibility to achieve a higher paycheck right now. Um, some companies are telling their employees that if you wanna work from home, that you need to give us the zip code of where you're gonna be. And based on your zip code, uh, you may see a decrease in your paycheck. Um, so just you know, do your research as you're making any of these, any of these decisions and, and just see what's available to you. Um, and just uh, you know, look before you leap. A couple of questions uh, in here that, that are referencing uh, productivity and, and the effect that that could have um, on the economy and, and what it might look like. Um, 
you know, asking how companies can increase efficiencies and why is productivity not, not there. So a few notes, you know, productivity is kind of historically a pretty noisy uh, data, piece of data on a one-off. You really want to see like longer trends to see if there's sustained meaningful productivity enhancements in place. Um, in particular, the, the negative productivity reading that we saw in Q1, or I'm sorry, in Q4 of 21, or no, Q1 of 22 was related to the negative GDP print that we saw, which was a bit of a one-off in my opinion. Um, there are other signs that productivity is actually quite strong. So um, you, one, you might say, all right, S&P 500 uh, companies, their profit margins are not quite at records, but they're still quite elevated versus the last 15, 20 years. Um, at the same time that all of these inflationary pressures are hitting them in, in the, you know, wage inflation, raw material inflation, transportation costs. So if companies can operate with profit margins near highs, at the same time there's cost inflation, you'd say, well, okay, well, they must be being more efficient um, somewhere in there. Uh, another way to look at it is, well, in Q4 21 GDP, US GDP hit an all-time high. We're still short a couple of million workers in the economy from pre-pandemic. So more output with fewer workers, some would argue that that is a sign of uh, productivity as well. I think to, to see if we're going to enter kind of a new phase of pandemic-related productivity, whether that's people working from home, the elimination of wasted time on commutes, Whatever some of the efficiencies, uh, you know, maybe, you know, uh, robots in factories, like any kind of stuff on that front, I think you'll need to see a much longer term time frame to kind of get a sense of whether that's really sticky or not. Um, but I do think that it takes a transformational event often throughout history for these kinds of things to kind of really get into the economy. I think COVID-19 was that. So, so time will tell, but I'm, I'm still optimistic, even if that chart uh, could you could leave you a little bit cold? I noticed another question here from one of our clients asking about uh, Roth conversions, and the question is, you know, they're about ready to have to start taking RMDs, and I just want to answer the question that RMDs from your traditional IRA are not allowed to be part of a Roth conversion, so that money has to come out. Income taxes are due on that. So for a Roth conversion to happen, if you're taking RMDs, you would have to do a conversion on money above and beyond the RMD requirement. Got one question about uh, some private real estate investments and kind of what they are. Um, so just just we there are several different products that are available um, for through our financial advisors and again um, reach out to your financial advisor to see if that's um, an appropriate investment uh, for you to go into um, they can be very specific in nature um, so focusing on industrial warehouses might be an example of one I think Amazon warehouses is kind of like a primary example of might not be able to buy the Amazon warehouses individually, but if you pull assets together, um, you can be able to do that and provide some multiple different um, leases on there um, and be able to provide some diversification that way. Or it could just be broad based real estate. So um, you can invest in um, apartment buildings, you can invest in grocery anchored retail malls. Um, it can invest in storage facilities, warehouse facilities, um, office buildings, um, et cetera. And they, it really does matter on location um, when you invest in, in real estate. So uh, Baird takes a, a very conservative approach to the um, offerings that we do have on the platform. So I would just suggest that you talk to your financial advisor and see if, those, if that is something um, that would make sense, sense for you. I will grab uh, another one or two. Um, someone's question about the kind of consumer cushion that I was talking about, and couldn't that ha it doesn't that necessarily have the opposite effect and has led to some of the spending that has caused inflation? I would say yes. I almost certainly the the pandemic pandemic era stimulus programs contributed greatly uh, 
to kind of the inflationary pressure we're seeing today. Um, it was it's certainly one factor, at least in addition to supply chain shortages, you know, war in Ukraine causing energy spikes, um, a lot else going on on the energy front. But, you know, the, the kind of starting from today and moving forward, you know, we have the inflation, it's here. The Fed is going to fight the inflation. It's laid that, that case out clearly. So going forward, you know, we are entering a period of economic slowdown by necessity. That's what the Fed is trying to engineer to get inflation under control. The, the, the point being just we, we haven't really ever had this kind of consumer cushion entering a period like this before. So you could definitely argue that it was, it was part of the problem. I think it could also be part of the solution and kind of just given where we are in that paradigm, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take anything on the side of uh, supporting the U.S. consumer as we kind of enter a period of slower growth. Um, one other question, someone asked kind of what was the market projecting or pricing in? So if, if the S&P and the NASDAQ are already in bear markets, what are they saying about the economic growth? Um, at this point, they're pointing to a, a, a slowdown for sure. Um, where they're at today, they're not quite at levels that you would, you know, that the average re recessionary period has seen in the past. Um, so we'll be watching it closely. The market, you know, is it's a voting machine, right? It's it's the the weight of everyone's opinion on where asset prices should be. So um, at this point, they're not pricing in a recession, in my opinion. Um, the average recessionary uh, drawdown in the stock market has been a bit farther. Um, so we'll we'll see from here. Um, but I would say at this point, they're definitely showing that we're going for a period of slower growth. And again, that's um, that's that's kind of the whole point of this all. Hey guys, we have about three minutes left, so maybe time for one or two more questions here. I can take one more question. <clears throat> uh, one of our clients is asking about a rule of thumb on Roth conversions. And the way I would answer that is that it's a decision that's very tailored to your situation. So there really isn't a good rule of thumb. Uh, if there's a rule of thumb is to make sure that after you run the numbers on your numbers, that it looks good. Uh, we do have the ability to analyze this for you. We can uh, put in some criteria and say, look, uh, we're interested in doing a Roth conversion as long as it stays below such and such tax bracket. So that way you're not slipping into higher tax brackets or spilling in um, to much higher tax brackets. And then run that over your lifetime with that new, that new mix of different tax status buckets, right? Because you'll have some taxable money, pre-tax money, and post-tax money. So how does that work on the spending patterns over your lifetime? And we'll project over your lifetime how much tax savings do we think you would personally achieve by doing a Roth conversion of X dollars um, with your life expectancy, et cetera. So that's, that's what I would recommend is actually go through the analysis. We'll do all the work for you. Um, and then present to you what we find. Let's get one more question. I'm happy to to grab a final one. So someone asked, if inflation is occurring globally, is it harder to get down? Are other countries doing the same thing that the Fed is doing? Um, very much so. Pretty much across the the developed world, uh, central banks are raising interest rates, getting more hawkish, job owning inflation that they're seeing. In their own countries, um, in some emerging markets, you know, you, you have these kind of inflationary spirals where the currency, um, you know, they kind of lose control of the currency a bit. You know, one thing I will say about uh, inflation in the U.S., the, the, the dollar being the reserve currency, the U.S. dollar hit about a 20-year high recently as the Fed has kind of talked up interest rates and made the U.S. a more attractive place to store capital. You know, the dollar, in some ways, you know, for the U.S. consumer makes things a little bit cheaper. A stronger dollar makes imports cheaper. So in some ways, we have kind of a, a, a bit of a built-in uh, helper with inflation in that way. Um, there are downsides to a stronger dollar as well. But given what all of the other uh, countries in the world are going through, most of them battling some sort of inflation and tightening policy, there are very few countries left easing policy. Um, it is kind of a global phenomenon that will that will more than likely lead to not just a U.S. slowdown, but but a bit of a global slowdown as well. 
Great. Thank you so much, Ross, Nick, Chris. We really do appreciate all your expertise today. Thank you everyone who joined us on the line. For those of you who would like to review today's presentation or listen to the recording, again, that will be made available about a week following today's call. Um, you can get it through your Baird Financial Advisor or you can go out on BairdWealth.com. Um, either way, you will get access to it. If we were not able to address your question or you'd like additional information, again, just reach out to your Baird Financial Advisor and they'll get you in touch with the appropriate contacts. I will also remind you all that next month we will not be hosting a webinar, but we will join you back on August 17th with our trust services company. So with that, thank you again, everyone, and have a good rest of your afternoon.